Good evening, All Gibbs, and welcome to All Gibbs Live. And with me this evening, for the first time as Prime Minister of St. Martin, is uh, Prime Minister, Mr. Uh, Dumps. Good evening, sir. How are you doing? Good evening. Um, doing fine. Good evening. Good evening to your viewers. And uh, we're happy to be here on your program. Well, thank you for being here this evening because we've been waiting for a long time. And yes. The entire population wanted to see you. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, it's been, uh, it's been uh, eight months already uh, since we've been in the a new job, a new assignment as uh, Prime Minister. And yes, uh, we, we admit we're a bit uh, late on the, you know, coming on the program. But however, better late than ever, and we are here uh, to share information with you wherever we can. Now, um, as Prime Minister St. Martin, what are some of the surprises you met in office? Because your, your experience go back from the former Nelson to his uh, State Secretary, Senator, etc. But what surprised you most about St. Martin today? Well, um, when we uh, were asked to uh, come and serve as um, Prime Minister of this country, we um, felt it an honor and um, taking in consideration the circumstances, we uh, agreed and we uh, took the challenge uh, to uh, serve and to lead uh, this island, uh, this country, uh, as to the best ability. What, what we encountered is um, there were some things, uh, some challenges, um, you know, from the onset. And in um, particular, uh, locally, we had uh, some issues, you know, you will recall with the Housing Foundation. Uh, there's a list of things that we met there, and we tried to deal with them one, one by one and to uh, solve them. And we also encountered the whole issue with um, budgetary constraints, uh, the debt situation of the country, uh, the relationship with the Netherlands, a whole series of things that we have been working on and trying to settle them one by one. And um, I think uh, so far we, we have done our best. A few of them has been, uh, have been cleared up. And um, a lot of court cases against government. Against government. And um, we got some few others, but they have our attention. And now, now it's been uh, the, there. We're in the hurricane season, and we have some storms to deal with. Now, um, you know, the thing is that besides being prime minister, and the prime minister is also responsible for general affairs, right? That's right. But you're, you're also Prime Minister, um, I mean, you're also Minister for Bromi. Yes. So you have ad added our work there. Yes. Um, we've, uh, in the cabinet, as you know, uh, when the government uh, sat, um, we were under pressure to establish a government. Otherwise, if uh, January 20th had come, there would have been a constitutional crisis uh, without having a government in place. So um, it was decided to... Um, take uh, two portfolios and put them under the responsibility of other ministers. And the prime minister, besides being minister of general affairs, we also have the responsibility as acting uh, minister of Bromi. And um, Rita Bourne Gums, minister Rita Bourne Gums, who is the minister of education, is also the acting minister of uh, VSA, which is uh, public health, um, social affairs, and labor. Um, that situation. Um, we expect or we hope to have that uh, completed or uh, changed then by next week in a week or two when the um, screening for the two other candidates will have been completed and um, we hope to expand the cabinet to seven ministers the way the, it is stated in the constitution and that would ease the direct workload on two particular ministers but so far we've been um, doing our best at it and um, doing what we can and uh, serving both both ministries I have to ask you this question because a lot of people call in here on this program asking, are you as Prime Minister and also Minister um, Rita Bourne Gums getting any extra money for? No, no, not one cent. Okay. <laughs> not one cent. And um, um, it's, it's good to make clear um, the, the, the law, the Constitution, or the laws of, of uh, salaries and so does not uh, permit for that. Um, we are getting uh, the compensation or the remuneration that one minister is, is due, and, um, and there is no extra, uh, not even overtime that you can charge. It's also good for people to know that, um, uh, because the impression is, is that um, here goes uh, the prime minister, and he's going to be getting another pension to add to the pensions he has. There is the prime minister, the minister of justice, because we're over 60. So we are not in a position to build up any pension with this job that we have at this moment. All right. So I guess for a lot of people, it's now clear that both the 
there are two gums and it's governed by the way. Well, there's a born gums and there's a gums. <laughs> I, I, wanna, I don't want to disrespect uh -huh. uh, Rita's husband's yeah. name, but there's a bor born gums and yeah. there's a gums. And none of them are re receiving any extra money because they are handling two portfolios. All right, so that's clear, right? That's now. clear. Right. Now, do um, you think it's been a burden on your government having two, two ministries still without the minister? Well, it's been it's been it's been challenges uh, one way, but you know, on the other end, um, it's um, it's it's been um, it has its uh, I wouldn't say positive, it has its good side on it, because um, you have five ministers and um, the process of, um, of of taking decisions is uh, much much more um, how you say uh, less challenging. Uh -huh. um, you got five ministers, and then um, the the services. Um, if you know how to divide your time properly. Uh, you can, um, you know, serve both of them. Of course, both of them do take a burden on you. Um, so the, when we get these two other ministers in, it will be a, a relief, uh, definitely, on, on Minister Bourne Gums and myself. Now it's been published in the media the names of the two persons that will be minister. You sh you care to share that with us? Uh, <laughs> regretfully, I'm in a position not to be able to share any names officially with you. Okay, but hmm. so the media was correct or not correct? Uh, I don't know. You'll have to ask the media where they got that information from. <laughs> so I guess we would just have to wait till the names are published. Yes, yes. Right. Now, you spend a lot of time in Parliament in the eight months that you've been in government. Is that something you expected? Well, you know, um, yes, I spent a lot of time in Parliament. In fact, I was in Parliament like uh, two day, uh, day and a half after I was sworn in. Um, I expected that, um, the, um, particularly the opposition members in Parliament um, are pretty well seasoned. Um, members of parliament, they, they've been in politics quite some time, and uh, we expect that, and uh, we dealt with it accordingly, and we give, go and give information as much as possible uh, that we can, and deal with the matters. But um, they have their role to play, and government, uh, we have our role to play, and um, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a healthy situation. Of course, uh, as the government, um, the parliament, um, you know, just like any new parliament, there's always a uh, um, some room for improvement uh, also in government and um, I think we have to work hard, be dedicated to St. Martin and give it our best shot and do our best at it. Now this is a unique parliament in that you have uh, the former Prime Minister Mr. Westcott and also you have uh, the leader of the National Alliance uh, MP uh, Mr. Marlin, two very experienced politicians while the coalition government is really not that experienced. Uh, yes, you have that situation, even though I must say in the coalition, there are members of the coalition in parliament that have served as ministers before, maybe um, not as long as, uh, as, um, as the former prime minister. But um, also, um, we have, um, yes, in general, the members of the coalition, uh, I wouldn't want to call them rookie, but some of them are there for the first time. And, um, you know, that's always a challenge because it's a learning process also. Now, um, there have been a lot of things happening on the island, and I want to go back to the, the integrity issue one, because that caused quite some stir in Parliament. Yes, yes. Um, Let me ask you, when the Minister of Justice went to The Hague in May of this year, he went to replace you? Did you were you the person to go, or did you ask him to go, or was it the Minister of Justice position to go? To negotiate the integrity uh, chamber with the Dutch. Well, well, first of all, the Minister of Justice, um, Minister Dennis Richardson, who, in my opinion, is doing an excellent job. Uh, don't forget, before in the former cabinet, he was also at the ending of the last government period. He was the one basically in charge and pulling the whole integrity issue. The integrity chamber matter is the responsibility of ministry, the Minister of General Affairs. However, in the protocol and the whole issue with the Dutch, there's also a part of it that has to do with justice, okay, the maintenance of justice. And that is issues that were being negotiated and talked about between the Minister of Justice of the Netherlands, the former Minister of Justice. Don't forget we had a former Minister of Justice in the Netherlands who resigned because of a, of a, of a, of a scandal um, before this new Minister of Justice came in, in the Netherlands. Uh, I don't know if you recall, if people have paid attention to it, the former Minister of Justice in the Netherlands, together with the State Secretary of Justice, they resigned because of a confusion about payment of money 
to a criminal as on a cup of money. But the minister, just as Mr. Dennis Richardson was in the Netherlands, talking about the maintenance of justice, uh, the program to get assistance for the police force on St. Martin, and that was agreed to be being put in a protocol, okay? A protocol according to Article 38.1 of the Charter of the Netherlands, which is a total legal document. And that negotiations that was taking place because of the, the fact that it had a, a arm, a piece of it was of our integrity chamber, we were in constant contact with each other. And basically, yes, normally a, a protocol has to be signed, could be signed by the minister, the, the prime minister. In this case, the minister of justice was authorized by my person to sign it. Now, the, the parliament of Simon went ahead with uh, integrity chamber your, with your um, government and approved it. Five didn't did not approve it from the from no the one was government. absent um, from the coalition and four went against right. it. Um, when you look at what's happening right now. Please explain to, 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 to our viewers the measure from the Dutch government. Is this, can this be characterized as a limited measure uh, in terms of high supervision directed towards the Ministry of Justice? Uh, well, there's several things playing a role there. Okay, first of all, let's talk about the integrity chamber first. The integrity chamber uh, is, must be separated from, in my opinion, from the matters in justice. Um, the integrity chamber was approved by the Parliament of St. Martin, okay, and that is the process of being carried out for that to be implemented. Where the uh, Ministry of Justice is concerned, okay, there is a difference of opinion that end up in a very serious difference of opinion uh, that results into action between the Prosecutor General, Mr. Schramm, in, 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 in Curacao, and the Minister of Justice, where there is a, in my opinion, a total uh, misinterpretation of the responsibility that the prosecutor has. Uh, in my opinion, the Minister of Justice it has certain authority to carry out uh, certain issues in the Ministry of Justice, and there is a difference of opinion where the prosecutor general thinks no, that he can implement certain units, in particular the criminal investigation unit. Um, there is a difference between that, between the prosecutor general and the Minister of Justice, and the um, prosecutor has basically complained the Minister of Justice to the Kingdom Council Ministers, the Minister of Justice of the, of the Netherlands, and they, on the Council of Ministers, on recommendation of the Minister of Justice of, uh, of the Netherlands, has put uh, what they call an instruction in, on the table, on the agenda, and, to be, and was discussed by the Council of Ministers of the Kingdom. That is why now that, in the process, that has to go through a process of going to the Council of State, the Rathenstaten, and they would give their opinion on it to say who's right or who's wrong. And that is why the Minister of Justice, Dennis Richardson, is in the Netherlands now, where he had his first talks with the Council of Advice. And we're going to fight it because we feel that it was not done correctly. And we have a right to do that, and that's what we're making use of to fight that. Because what we have noticed is that uh, time to time, uh, the Dutch government has been taking issues in the charter of the kingdom, taking it totally out of context. Now, people may say, yes, but, you know, uh, the press report this and the press report that. Having been in the parliament of the Netherlands Antilles, we have experienced this as Netherlands Antilles at least four or five times in the past. I very, very well remembered when uh, Susie Camilla Ramos, for instance, was the Minister of Justice, where the Dutch government took an issue about the Coast Guard. And when we fought, as Netherlands Antilles fought it in the Council of State, the Rant and Stater, the Council of State gave the Netherlands Antilles right and told the Dutch government you were wrong. So these are things that, um, that, that happens, you know, when you have different forces playing a role. And we believe and we are convinced that uh, when it comes to the Council of State, the Council of State will give us right. Uh, um, back in the early 1990s, Simon was placed on the highest provision. That is correct. Now, if the Minister of Justice from Simon is not successful in this trip to Holland, how different will this measure be compared to what happened to the one in 1994? Uh, well, first of all, to begin with, I, I cannot see, I have not, uh, we have checked with our advisors, I have not, do not see where 
they're going to be able to implement a what is called a full uh, measure of higher supervision uh, because first of all the, the the structure has changed we're not an island territory anymore and if any sort of instruction will have to be taken or be done that will place uh, the authority more in the hands of the governor that we have at the moment but to say that uh, we're going to have an instruction a supervision like we had on the um, in the 90s on the um, being an island territory mm -hmm. where your uh, high supervision was kind of like uh, uh, coordinated by the central government we don't have no more central government so uh, whatever they're going to try to implement that would have to be take place under the, the supervision of the governor our own local governor we have a governor now not a lieutenant governor but we have a governor but considering all the facts i do not see how they're going to get through with that because i believe that they're on the wrong path so the reason i ask that question just is for viewers to understand is that it is different in a way because here you have the Ministry of Justice is the one that is targeted, it's not the general administration correct. of the government of Saint Martin. Correct, right? correct. I think we are still in a phase after four years, uh, or to um, that that people, first of all, um, it's people need to you know go through that process of learning and so, do not understand and realize that we are in a different setting, and we see that often too, not only in the organization of uh, of um, of the civil servants. But also in the political area, where um, the, the the roles are different now. We're not an island territory, and we got certain responsibility that we have to be able to carry, take on ourselves and carry. Okay, and that we see a lot in particular, the role of parliament, the way it's being performed in some times, at sometimes in some areas, compared to the island territory, island council. So um, that needs that's going to take some time for us to develop and get out of that mode of being in island territory and performing as of as if we were in the island council. Now, um, you wrote a letter to the council ministers in the Kingdom Council about, uh, and correct me here because I've read this in one of the papers mm -hmm. where you stated in your letter that uh, civil servants from the Netherlands are no longer welcome in some modern law, is that correct? <laughs> Was that part of your letter? What we said, what we said is that, look, over over the months <clears throat> that this government have sat in, in the past, too, certain civil servants would come from the uh, Netherlands and they would ask to meet with um, with a minister. Um, uh, we, from January, we have insisted that um, civil servants come in to St. Martin, now that we are a country, uh, e even before that, if a civil servant comes to your country, they should talk to their equal. And the equal of a civil servant from the Netherlands is the civil servant that we have here on St. Martin. But still, at times we have, how you say, stretched out our ar arms and trying to make peace. And we would say, okay, a civil servant has asked to meet with the minister, so we will still meet with the, minister, with, meet with the civil servant. And what happened in the case of the chief of police from the Netherlands, uh, he asked to meet with the Minister of Justice. The Minister of Justice do not have any obligation to meet with the civil servant, with the chief of police. If a, we are a country, and if you are the chief of police from the Netherlands and you come to visit St. Martin, your speaking partner that you should speak with is the chief of police of St. Martin. Okay, Minister speaks with ministers, chief of police speaks, speaks with chief of police. And what I said in my letter, we didn't say, in fact, when the chief of police uh, met with the Minister of Justice and behaved so rude, okay, that the chief of the cabinet wrote in the report and was shocked, we took a decision. The next day, we called in the Dutch representative and we said, this behavior of a civil servant towards a minister in our country is unacceptable. And we took a decision there and then that the council, the ministers, will not be meeting anymore with civil servants when they come to visit. Doesn't mean that they can't visit. Yes, we welcome them to visit. But when you come to visit, you will speak with your equal who is a civil servant employed by St. Martin. Let me explain it for example. If the chief of police of the Netherlands and the chief of police from Aruba or from Curacao come to St. Martin, then you meet with the chief of police of St. Martin. When the minister from Aruba, Curacao or the Netherlands come, then he will meet with the minister. It's very simple. We never said that they are not welcome in St. Martin. 
they're welcome, but then they will have to meet with their peers and not with someone who is their, could be their superior. Now, um, on the issue still of integrity, uh, I, I had the Minister of Justice here uh, when he came back from The Hague, and uh, I asked him who will pay for it. And he said it will be the Dutch, but he didn't know what the budget will be. I understand the budget is 22 million euros for two years. No, what they're talking about for the 22 million mm -hmm. is the uh, for the additional assistance that they want to be giving to the justice chain, not only from St. Martin, but from Curacao and Aruba. Oh, okay. And that 22 million is uh, to help pay for the additional RSC members. For the three hours. Uh, for, yeah, for the, for the, yes, for the, for the equipment and so. Um, the integrity chamber, uh, the Dutch in the beginning, uh, wanted to finance it completely. So I, as prime minister, told them, I said, no, we do not want the Dutch to finance it fully. Because, uh, Aurel, we have to get away from this thing of leaving the Dutch finance everything and looking for financing uh, easy from them. So then, so then, otherwise, Mr. Prime Minister, the initiative to share the cost came from you then? Yes, yes, okay. yes. For the, for the integrity chamber, yeah. definitely. Definitely. There's even some examples we use because when they, when they told me, when they said that they're going to finance it, I said, no, you will co-finance it. And I, I remember they telling me, but you don't have the money. And I told them, I said, well, the way I was brought up was that, you know, try to work hard and pay for your own stuff. Never leave your rich friends pay for you to go to the movies. Mm -hmm. That's the way I was brought up, you know. Because when somebody pays everything for you, then they have the decisive voice. The Dutch says it all the time. We betalt, bepaalt. So we insisted, we want to, if there's any financing, we're going to do it. And if there's any additional or whatever, we talk about co-financing. But we must, we must get off the track that being, uh, uh, that every time if something is offered to us free, that we jump at it and take it. Is there any date set for the implementation of this uh, integrity chamber? No, the, uh, no there's no. Um, the date is not set in, in uh, as yet in the law. Um, we are busy with the quartermaster setting up the, the the secretariat and stuff and things like that. And um, the the law has been accepted. There was uh, one change made in the ordinance, and that is the appointment of um, of the, the the chairman of the of the of the integrity committee. And that process now is being done. The law is about to be published, and then we will continue setting it up. I, I want to move on to, to the Coast Guard. There, there were some issues since 10, 10, 10. It's St. Martin and the Dutch government with the Coast Guard in terms of payment and understand St. Martin paid its share. Where are we right now in terms of paying our share of the Coast Guard, and what are we getting for it? Well, there's, uh, I'll be honest with you, I don't know all the details at the moment because the Coast Guard falls under the responsibility of the Minister of Justice. We've had some issues about the payments and also about not only the payments, but one of the biggest issues that we have about the Coast Guard is the functioning of it, okay, where um, still the, the, the line of command is, you know, uh, offshore, far away. So um, that is an ongoing discussion um, with, with the Dutch and with Curacao and with Aruba because the Coast Guard is supposed to be taking care and looking after all of us. We have paid as much as possible that we can into it up to this moment. But still, I think there's some arrays. And um, the whole thing is not only about the payments, as far as we're concerned, about the operation of it. That's more important to have a Coast Guard that is really, really operational and servicing also uh, the, the, the waters around St. Martin. I brought up uh, to the commander, in particular Mr. Lauder, that as far as I'm concerned, as we're concerned, also the admiral of the Dutch uh, army was down uh, a couple of weeks back, is that we believe that we should seek closer cooperation with the Coast Guard, the US Coast Guard, and also the regional Coast Guard. Because we are in a region, we have other islands around us, and the only way we can really service our islands where the Coast Guard is concerned with the assignment it has, which is um, um, safety, combatant drugs and all that, is to work with those Coast Guard units that is right around us, the French, the Americans, and the other islands with us. Instead of just having a Coast Guard, that is, uh, we can maintain a relationship with that in Curacao and Aruba, but it's still too far away to just be dependent on one Coast Guard.
Is it going to be difficult for us because the U.S. Uh, military removed the two remaining ships that they had in the Caribbean, and now what they're doing is they're depending on the French and the Dutch government and the British to help them in, in terms of uh, drought interdiction support in the Caribbean region. Yes, the, 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 everybody has been downsizing, okay, their operations, their military and their Coast Guard, but still there is a presence. And the strategy is simple, and we can, I support that strategy. If we can work together, it would mean less cost on a particular country's budget. And also, both countries, all these countries have a benefit in trying to fight the drug traffic that is going through the Caribbean. The fight against drug trafficking has been an ongoing fight for 20, 30, 40 years. And you know what's funny about it? The Caribbean gets blamed for it, but it's the big countries that are the users and that is pulling the demand, there's a demand. And now it used to be in the United States solely, but now there's a big demand for drugs also in Europe. And it's no more than right that the British, the French, the Dutch, and everybody should help the Americans in fighting the transiting of drugs to the Caribbean. Prime Minister, uh, Transparency International also had their um, findings published just recently. And uh, there were some surprises, especially in terms of poverty. Were you surprised there? About um, concerning? Poverty. Yes. Well, well trans uh, trans um, Transparency International um, did touch on that. Um, they touch on all areas, and um, we have taken note of all the report because this is now the fourth report about um, integrity. We can say that was um, published and completed about the island. Um, the area of, um, of poverty that we are having on the island is um, is something of concern. Um, we are addressing it as much as we can at the moment, and it means that we all have to, in particular. In a particular area, the economy, the economic area, and also the social area, um, to um, that needs to be tackled and find solutions for the problems that we're facing where poverty is concerned. You know, there's a whole issue about the United Nations and the uh, elimination of poverty over a period of time, and uh, that has our attention. The social services are working steadily on that, and also. I can tell you what has our attention very, very much is the issue about um, ch the rights of the children. You know, we, we have to, in this society, in this country, we have to start really, really paying attention to the care of our children and not just say, you know, it's up to the teacher, or up to the government. We've got to find a way to get our, our society, our parents involved in finding solutions. Because I believe in, in what the good gentleman, a consultant, came down. And he said, if, if you do not take care of your children, then you do not have a country in the future. And there is so much other areas where society itself can just take time out. And, you know, everybody complains, yes, the people running two, three jobs. But you know what? A lot of us are doing two, three jobs just to be able to keep up with the Joneses next door. And we need to redress that and revisit and start paying more attention. More volunteers is needed in taking care of children. So your, your government is in agreement with the findings from Transparency International? Well, the Transparency International, where the integrity issues is concerned, they have a very wide uh, listing. Um, if we agree with it, yes, uh, certain things, and if we agree certain things, we look at it differently. But they identify the role in general of all elements of government. And uh, what, one of them is important is training you know, and, and, and capacity enhancement of the machinery of civil servants, of parliament, and also those of uh, government. I think there's a place where they're even they're recommending of sort of like courses for people who intend to enter into public service. Too often, um, a lot of people want to serve, you know, being on a political list, but it's important before you go on a political list to understand what you're getting into and to study and to realize what it is and not, uh, realize that when you get elected as a parliamentarian, you are a parliamentarian, you are a lawmaker, and you don't necessarily go and sit on the chair of the executive branch of government. But these are things that it will take time for us to get there, but we have to start paying attention to them now. I think what shocked a lot of people was the 75% the of the population in terms of households living below the poverty level. I don't know if, if that is a clear figure of 75%. Uh, I think there was, uh, I don't know the exact figure, mm. but I know there was, um, there was in, in, in transparency, there was something about poverty. I think you talked probably about the, in the other report, the United Nations report, but um, 
there are um, it's it's off balance, and we have to do something to bring it back into balance. Because in, uh, um, in, in, in some reports, it's instead that sixty percent of the workforce in Saint Martin earns minimum wage or below, and that itself is is quite a high figure. That 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 is a high figure. That is a high figure. But like I said, these are things that we need to be redressed, addressed, but address them jointly. You know, um, we talk, we had an issue about um, livable loan, a minimum loan, and minimum wages, and so. And it has to be brought together jointly with employers and employees association to sit together and address this matter. Because um, just by saying government is going to change laws to implement it and minimum wages should be raised, you know, just every minute like that, is probably not the best solution. We need to do these things jointly together. Because when you, when you look at figures where it's stated that a household to live comfortably would need 4,000 guilders a month, and that's that's a lot in St. Martin. That is a lot in St. Martin, but again, again, it depends on to what standard you're you're raising at. You know, you got you got you got household that um, that looks that could um, could probably live on, on less and and still save. And it depends in life what you want. And that's a very part of, of social education. I think we need for the society. Um, where on what are people spending their money? You know, um, probably too much trying to live up with the neighbors and you know comply. Just look around and figure out how many new cars are being changed every minute. And because what? The banks give loans easily for cars. Have you ever heard a bank uh, here advertising? And we talk about this 20 years ago, about uh, borrowing money to build a house or to buy a house or to buy a condo. No, cars seem to be the easiest thing to, to finance. So what happens? Everyone is led into believing that you know buy a new car and live in a shack as long as the car looks good. What What about the, the sovereign debt of St. Martin? Because you know, in the former Nelson Tillys, there was a debt of billions of guilders. When they became a country within the Kingdom of the Netherlands, her debt was reduced to what below a uh, hundred thousand. No. When When we became country, um, there was a debt that they said, uh, "St. Martin, that's your debt." And 70 percent, I think. I think it was 120, 120 million um, that was written should be written off for, on behalf of Simon. But, but I mean, in terms, so that, in other words, um, at the time of the former Nelson and Tillys, was Saint Martin share 17 percent of that debt at the time? You know, I, I I cannot answer oh, okay. you on that. I, I don't forget, I left active politics okay. in 2006. Okay. And um, <laughs> I I was uh, I did nothing but um, you know did the private sector. Until I came back and was actually come back last year, but I do know that um, when we became country, I was told that the debt was that St. Martin was assigned to St. Martin that was written off, uh, paid for by the Dutch, uh, was 120 million uh, guilders. However, there were some conditions that apparently we did not meet, in order and there was a time limit, okay, to comply with that condition of really uh, identifying that debt and. Uh, not calculated, but uh, describing it. We had to submit invoices, etc. Well, yeah, in in a way, yeah, and you had X amount of time to to do it. Uh, for what I understood, that uh, time expired, and we were not successful. And the Dutch did not, uh, how you say, uh, readdress it by saying, you know what, I'll give you an extension on that. And that's that's a sticking point we right now. It. We lost it, and that's a sticking point right now. Of we're going to become country. Uh, this was promised. There was an extension to it. And we got to start all over with with little or with nothing, and then still account to agreements have to build all of these institutions that is costing money. But as Prime Minister, now have you said to the Dutch, look, we are a new government. Give us a chance to renegotiate this deal. We've been we've been we've been from day one, uh, Oral. I've been asking and negotiating and talking to the Dutch. In fact, let me tell you a story. I uh, was. Take my, I swore in on the 19th of December, uh, 2014, and they, in the morning I asked someone to get me the numbers of um, the Prime Minister, Mr. Rutte and Mr. Plasterk, which I, I did not get. But half an hour later, I got phone calls from uh, Rutte and uh, Plasterk, Prime Minister Rutte, congratulating me on my appointment and my swearing in, which was to take place the afternoon. Um, I told them plain that. Um, St. Martin is, is going to have a new government and that we want a good relationship in the kingdom 
and that we want to have uh, work towards having peace and tranquility in the kingdom. Well, um, since then it hasn't been peace and tranquility, um, and we've talked about it. We've every time we we agree on something uh, when the ministers were here or wherever we met, it was yes, 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 and when two weeks later it was a different story. Uh, it's like you're playing soccer and. Um, uh, as the game go along, uh, the goal post is being moved further and further. So basically, you're, you're hampered from scoring a goal because you got to run further and longer to reach to, to the goal post. Um, we are waiting now the return of Mr. Hassink. Mr. Hassink, the Minister of Finance, is presently uh, in the Netherlands together with the Minister of Justice. Um, they will be talking to um, the Dutch government, Mr. Plasterk in particular. And we are waiting to see what the result of those talks would be uh, by uh, the end of the week. You know, uh, Mr. Hassing was Minister of Finance, was on this program. And at the time, he said that, um, and this is not verbatim right now, that uh, Tim Martin will look into the matter of the Dutch government request for the best islands in terms of the turnover tax. And it didn't happen. So. Is your government prepared to deal with that issue? And probably maybe the Dutch government will, 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 will look the other way too. You mean what with the turnover tax? Yeah, because they were complaining that goods coming from Zimbabwe was also charged oh. turnover tax. And yes. the finance minister at the time on this program said that hey, we will look really to, to entertain it. But it didn't happen. No, um, because you just can't um, go in, in, in the system. How are you going to, it's about, it's about how do you determine what is going to save Ben Station? Mm -hmm. You understand that? Because the turnover tax, is implemented by by the by the business. Okay, every uh, every end of the year, every end of the month, okay, every fifteenth right. of the month, you got to take whatever you turn over, and you have to go and you pay turnover tax on that. How do you determine what a, a business has sold that is going to save us, Stacia? Who's going to pay for the administration of that? Okay. Uh, if you if you're selling if you're selling if you're selling rice and you sell a hundred bags of rice and you um, you pay your turnover tax on the fifteenth on you sell a hundred bags of rice you turn over a thousand guilders so you go you pay your your five percent turnover tax how do you know how much of that rice has gone to stage or to Sabre? that is the whole thing how are you going to find a mechanism but you see that is always being used in my opinion to you know, point fingers at St. Martin and say, you're doing this against Sabre and Stacia. We got a problem. We got Rainier. Rainier is owned, uh, the Dutch government owns shares in Rainier, okay? And every time Rainier is servicing Sabre and Stacia. We have asked the Dutch many times, when are, when are you going to put a contribution into easing the fares for the people from Sabre and Stacia? Plant to refuse. Rainier is told, deal with it yourself. So, you know, it takes two hands to clap. And that's sometimes some Dutch people, some Dutch government representatives have a difficulty in understanding. So what you're asking the Dutch government is to subsidize the, the, the fares between Sabre? Well, the, the Sabre, the, the Sabre they, right now they are looking at the formula how to uh, come with a solution for that. Because the people on, Sa on station, particularly in Sabre, are complaining about the the, the, the fears of, 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 of Rainier to those two islands. But Rainier just can't go and drop a fare um, and sell it, sell it uh, cheaper than what it costs to operate a flight. So that is where we expect, and we're behind the Dutch government, to please come in and find a formula to, if you don't want to help Rainier directly because you fear that the help is going to go to a flight that's going to buy, find a formula to help the poor people on Stacia and Sabre to come and fly over. Now, uh, coming back to the High Council of State, the High Council of State came into existence after October 10, 10, 10. Yes. Right? And um, they've always All had- All three of them. Yeah, they've always had problems in terms of uh, budget. Yes. Um, <clears throat> look, <clears throat> when um, somewhere I think, I but there, I, I, I wasn't present, but I, I think when uh, all the calculations were made, a few things was forgotten, or was, they, they did not see the total picture yet. And um, they are there, the High Council of State, the Council of Advice, the, audit cha the General Audit Chamber, and, um, and um, the Ombudsman. And um, they are doing their work. 
we, when we went into country, we asked for these things, okay? We demanded them, we have them. We have, uh, we're the only country in the kingdom that has uh, a constitutional court. Okay, that's not a heavy financial burden, but we have our ombudsman, we have our council of advice, and we have our general audit chamber. Now we've also got the electoral council, and we got our social economic council. Then we have our corporate governance council. And all of these uh, um, bodies have to be financed by one means or the other. And it all falls on the budget of general affairs. Um, they are departments that doesn't bring in income, but they have expenses with it. And they are part of the system because if you want to be a country and respect it, your laws and so before they go to parliament or before parliament approves them or before they've been handled, must go to a council of advice. And with time, we will have to find ways and means uh, to cut somewhere in order to maintain them. Um, but the, the budget, is it in the millions? Which budget? The, for the High Council of State? I, I don't know the exact budget, but I know um, we got to pay for their rent where they are, their, their staff. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not cheap staff because you need good qualified lawyers, mm -hmm. which is difficult to find uh, to, uh, to, to work at these institutions. And um, also, we um, um, there's a small remuneration, a little uh, pittance, a little yeah. contribution that that the members get, and um, those are being looked at. But it's very challenging because to get good lawyers, to be able to get good advices, uh, is not cheap. Let me ask this because you know, um, the government of Somalia want the private sector to p play a particular role in terms of counterpart, etc. Counterpart. Counterpart in the labor play in the labor yeah. market, and then you see um, in the in the local papers, uh, employment or government position, and some of the conditions. In fact, one condition that really struck me was minimum of fifteen years. How could the government ask for minimum of fifteen years for a sector director for the for the justice ministry? Then you don't want anyone from Somalia. Well, you know, it's it's yes, you you're looking, but you know, this uh, the you, I think you're talking about the ad for the secretary general. Yes, yeah, fifteen years. Minimum. Was it fifteen? Yeah, I, I, I'm not I'm not yeah. familiar with that. I I I don't. I'll have to double check that. That's right. In fact, and I brought it up to some members of parliament. I also brought it up to to the leader of the us party. I thought that that was really surprising of this government to ask. Well, that kind of requirement. Well, you know, the, the, the Secretary General of the Ministry of Justice is a very important position. I, I, I'll i have to double check that before commenting on it because I would think uh, it is it is a long period of time. I think more um, a five-year period of experience in, in, a, in a similar position would be more um, more feasible. But I, I would, I'll have to check that out and see what, what happens there. Because, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, a lot of people on this island the argument is that uh, young St. Martiners can't get a fair chance in the country anymore. Uh, there are the ads from the government, again, asking for three and four years' experience. Instead of the government saying, look, we're going to rule, we're going to govern by example. We're going to bring in the young professionals, and we're going to bring in also the experienced person, and you're going to work three years, and it's going to stick. They tried it in the 1990s. It didn't work. Maybe now we should try it again. Well, I can tell you, I can, I can assure you, um, and I, I wouldn't want to mention any names here, but uh, we are working on bringing back young people. We are in the process of uh, changing what is called the requirements of make it more encouraging for young people from St. Martin to come back. In fact, I know I got two personal cases where I basically, uh, as Minister of General Affairs, Overruled um, certain advices that was was sent, and basically saying, you know, disregard this advice. We're going to go for this local Samaritan who's been applying and who's been having the challenges. You see what happened? Um, you got to be very vigilant in 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 the system because sometimes as ministers you get things, uh, and you are asked in according to good governance to follow the advice from the organization. But you know, we've taken positions and saying, look, organization, which means the civil servants organization, we don't agree with this. And we're going to make an exception and not break the law, not bend the law, 
but take a principled decision in saying this is what's going to happen. This person is coming to work. Don't forget though, in governments at this moment, there is in part of the ministries, most all of the ministries I must say, a, a group of young Samaritans and young people, qualified, educated, that is back, okay? That is very enthusiastic and it is really, really, really making a contribution to the development of this country. Yes, we need to employ much more, but we need also to tell the organization and establish how we going how we want these people to come back. We just attended the, and supported the all the programs they had in attracting young people in, in the Netherlands. I can tell you personally, from personal experience, from emails and so I got a lot of people. You're gonna see you're gonna see probably in the in the in the running of 2016 a influx of young people returning uh, that is unbelievable. Uh, several reasons. Um, the Netherlands is not, Holland is not anymore the place where young people from St. Martin, or from the Caribbean in fact, or from the Netherlands, from, uh, from the islands, would go and um, would stay and because it's comfortable. Why not? It's not the days of in the 80s where the big companies, the KPMGs, the PwC, would be tracking you from in school and offering you these fantastic offers, okay? BMW cars, this salary, free phone, free this. That has changed, that is changing, ha has changed also. And young people, uh, because of the atmosphere that is developing in the Netherlands, uh, Caribbean young people is noticing and saying, you know what, this ain't nice no more. Because don't forget, there's a lot of stress also in the Netherlands among ethnic groups, okay? Just follow the, 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 the news and, and a lot of young people who have gone for an education is saying, you know what, it's time now, let's come back. Also, that you have a situation that uh, more and more they're realizing that the, 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 the country, the St. Martin in particular, has changed now. It's a country and that there's something that they can help build and make a contribution to. They are being encouraged every day every week in every form and fashion. And trust me, I think next year, 2016, you're going to see a flood of young people coming back. Uh, we had quite an uh, interesting day looking out for Hurricane Danny, who was downgraded. But I got to tell you this, I drove with my wife from the Dutch side to the French side, and we took video of both sides of the island, and I saw something I never saw in my life before. It was coordinated, really coordinated. There were gendarmes at the border, police at the border. Uh, most businesses were closed down. Of course, Danny didn't come. But I think I got to give you all the air for this one because really it was well coordinated. Thank you. Um, yes, it was, it was, uh, it was well coordinated um, between both sides. Mm -hmm. um, to begin with, um, from the time we sat as prime minister, one of the uh, priorities we've set is the relationship improving, the relationship and coordination, cooperation with the French side. We've had a very good um, relationship built up with the former uh, prefet, Mr. Chopin, and um, we have a new um, prefet, Madame Le Prefet, and um, we've had a very good relationship with her, and also even in the time of preparation for um, the arrival of um, Hurricane um, Danny, we met several times, and um, it was in the papers, and we coordinated um, a lot of things, not only the cooperation between the emergency services, like the fire department, and um, the other emergency services, the medical services in case we need each other, but we also um, coordinated implementation of certain uh, procedures. For instance, uh, we agreed that uh, if any side felt it necessary to implement a curfew, that we will do that uh, jointly. The uh, announces about um, closing of businesses uh, was coordinated. The announcement of school closures was not needed because the French side schools are still closed until next week. And also the uh, possible uh, effect aftermath by having joint controls at the border between the gendarmes and police. That was all organized and coordinated. And uh, we're very happy that it worked out well. And we look forward to working jointly together. Even the announcement before each one of us went on the radio, that was shared. And what also was shared is the different information that we were getting from the uh, different weather bureaus. You know, the French side follows uh, the European models of tracking hurricanes. 
we on the Dutch side up to now has been following the American system. If you look at the Weather Channel, you will see that even the Americans now are referring to the European models and tracking hurricanes and storms. So that was a very good experience. I consider it a warm up for the future. Yeah. I, I really was, I was impressed, really impressed. It's the first time and I hope it continues like that. The reason why I say this, Mr. Prime Minister, because in 1995, just after Hurricane Lewis, I was on the French-Dutch border in Colbe, and there were about 100 people held up at the border. And the French military refused to let them cross. The river. I remember that time very well. In fact, I called from my phone to the then governor, Lieutenant, who's now Minister of Justice, yes. about that. And it was a very ugly scene at the time. I hope it never comes to that again. I hope it never comes to that. And uh, as long as I'm the prime minister, uh, you know, I have uh, family on the French side, and um, we would always, uh, it's a priority. Uh, you must be able to live good with your neighbors. And, you know, I always remember something my grandmother said, it's better to have good neighbors than a faraway family. So um, we intend to strengthen that friendship in that relationship and coordination with the French side. I know we don't have a lot of time, Mr. Prime Minister, but um, the media was a little taken back in your first news briefing um, that you had. And you got quite some viewers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, uh, I don't want to go back there, but um, it was, you know, you can, um, you can keep something in for so long. And um, basically what I was saying, and I think I said in the press briefing also, but that got buried away because of one, one word I used, which I retracted, is that um, if we're going to build St. Martin, all of us have to build St. Martin together. And um, I said it before, and I've said here on my trips, that uh, three trips that I've had in, uh, in the honor in representing St. Martin so far, when you go in the outside in Washington, Everybody's concerned about stability in government on St. Martin. And when you have the cases that are familiar to all, where everyone is every week or every month, you know, threatening and saying government fall, government fall, it doesn't do us any good. And also, um, you know, what is said. But, you know, I said what I said. Um, I maintain to the message. Uh, maybe the words was not the right one. But we also have, we all have a responsibility on building this, this country. I'm not saying that you have to go on the radio and TV and say every day that, um, that the cabinet Gums or Marcel Gums is doing something good and he's good all the way. No. Criticism is good. I can handle it. Uh, I, 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 don't know. I have no problem. Um, I'm trying to run the government uh, to the best of my ability. And the thing a lot of people forget is that um, maybe I'm not sugarcoating anything. I was asked to do a job. And I think I'm going to... I've, decided to do the job in the best interest of the country, and um, that's what I'm trying to do. But I also need the help of everyone. In Washington, in Tortola, in Martinique, everywhere I've been, everyone asks you one question, stability in your government. And how people ask you, how is, it, how is it possible you have three governments in four years? And sometimes if you stop for a moment and you ask yourself, how is that possible? But it happened. No, let's forget that. Let's keep some stability. And let us try govern this country and build it for us, for our children, in fact. Because, you know, at our yeah. age, I don't know your <laughs> age, but we're we, we do, we, we, we getting there. And, um, yes, um, we will have more press briefings also. And, um, you know, I'm just asking everyone to come and help build this country. Well, we, we have the time, Mr. Prime Minister. we only got uh, 25 seconds to close. Anything else you want to add? Well, first of all, I want to thank you. Um, regret it took some while. We've been this program been in the making for quite some time, and I promise you that uh, it will not be so long. And we will come back and uh, you know share some information with you and with your viewers. Thanks, uh, viewers, for the opportunity, and um, God bless St. Martin. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. All the best. And that's it for now. See you next time. Dylan, good night. Take care. Bye.